So as a business owner, you've really got two things. You, if you can't control your price, you've got to control your costs. And if you can't control your price, you've got, you know, in your quarterly sessions and you're thinking innovation, if you can't control your price, your price is set by the market, potentially, you've got to control costs. You've got to get yourself out of a price-driven marketplace. Welcome to another installment of the Perspective Podcast. My name is Devin. This is my co-host, Mitch Harley. Today, we got Kobe Simmons back again for another conversation. Um, we were just chatting before we got on uh, to record here about how Australia is kind of opening things back up. And um, that creates a lot of opportunity for people and for businesses to start to flourish again. And uh, we really just wanted to have a conversation about um, using this as an opportunity to accelerate your business, um, look for opportunities where they wouldn't be, find those niches that are out there. Um, so we're kind of going to do, do a bit of a Q and a firing squad here. Um, and we're going to get deep into a couple of case studies, uh, surrounding some businesses that we know, uh, of, you know, that they've been, you know, in the situation they're doing well, or they're not doing well and what we would do in our, uh, from our perspective. So I guess Kobe to kick things off. Um, you had mentioned that the uh, the hospitality industry is is really really suffering as a result of all of these things, you know, restaurants and hotels and um, tourist type stuff. Uh, let's start there. I think that's the biggest and hardest thing to um, to you know attack in this kind of regard. What would you do if you were in that situation? Let's say you had a hospitality business and you're you know getting ready to open back up. Where would you start? Yeah, look, thanks. It's great to be back. Um, look, you know, that's what we, yeah, we were talking about, um, you know, hospitality businesses really suffering as a consequence of public health restrictions. So let's just be really clear that in order to control COVID, we've said, let's not get together. Um, let's not go into environments where, you know, the flu or, or COVID can spread. So public governments around the world have put public health restrictions in place. Here in Australia, we've just come out in Sydney, Australia. We've just come out of 107 days of lockdown and hospitality has been allowed to open, you know, slowly. Um, and so the, the issue here that we can talk about, you know, in terms of exploding or accelerating out of the pandemic is that there's, there's not a lack of demand with hospitality right now. The, the issue right now in the industry for the next six months is a labour shortage. And the labour shortage, you know, different economies in different places, but in this economy is largely driven by, by a working tourist, working backpacker, working traveller market. And our borders have been closed, you know, on and off uh, for, for a long period of time. And so if you're backpacking on your gap year, and, and thinking about coming to beautiful Australia, which I, I highly recommend you do because it's an amazing country, is that um, you can't get in. And if you can get in, you've got to quarantine in a five-star hotel for 14 days. At the moment, they're going to change that. Um, and so we've lost that labour. And so what's happening right now is hospitality is competing for labour. So, so it's it's not so much a question of you know should we you know should we do Uber Eats or or should we do you know uh, you know menu log or, or any of the different kind of um, ordering online ordering systems. I think that challenge has been addressed. The address what you've got to address right now is being an employer of choice. It's got to be sexy. It's got to be attractive to work in your organisation. And so. The question I've got for people that are listening in terms of if in, in any business, anyone listening, you've got to create an environment and a culture where people are banging on your door saying, I want to work for you. In fact, I want to work for you so much that I'll come and work for you for free. You and spoke so, really you know, passionately about this in our, in our last conversation about how you can make your business attractive to people who are looking for work. Um, how would you break that down in a way that, uh, it's, you know, a business today could just start implementing certain things? Put the music on. That's the first thing. I did a poll on LinkedIn yesterday. Like, what kind of music do you play in your office? And, and it got, a, you know, we had, you know, there was, there was something like 2,000 votes on that poll um, and, 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 you know, 25,000 views on LinkedIn. It's crazy. You know, LinkedIn, you know, should you play music in the workplace? Yes, you should. Yes, you should, because that's going to attract the culture. Okay, maybe not black death metal, but you've got to think about, you know, you've got to think about how do you create a vibe and a culture. A restaurant, sorry, let me rephrase that, hospitality, atmosphere, workplace atmosphere. And that's kind of the first thing. And then, you know, 
you know, what's the acceptable standard in terms of how you greet each other and what, what are your values? So a really simple campaigning of value of, hey, let's be friendly and let's put the music on. And it's not about loud music, but you've got to create an atmosphere. And so with a workplace atmosphere, then you're going to get people going, like they look forward to coming to work and putting the tunes on. You know, we've got, we've got guys down, you know, they're, they're not very far from me in this studio right now, down in our factory who are powder coaters, you know. We cut metal, bend metal, powder coat metal in one of our businesses. They're not far from me in the studio. Those guys have a great time because we bought them an enormous DJ desk with huge speakers. And, you know, I do have to go and tell them to turn it down occasionally because it comes up into the office. But those guys crank the tunes every day. They have a great time and then they DJ different playlists. And then someone puts on country and then they banter with each other and you know they razz each other over the country music. And then it's trance music and then it's it's hardcore metal music. And and so they have a great time just with the banter and, and you know the workplace banter. And so I think that you, you as an employer, if you are compelled to play the victim card and say, oh, my God, people are so frustrating. It's really hard to find great people. You're not attractive and you've got to own that. You've got to own that. And so, you know, that's, you know, I can labor on it all day. I think Man. that brings up two points because um, it's, it's not just Australia that, that has an issue with labor. Now, what I have seen and have heard is in the North America market, Canada and the States, it's not that there's a labor shortage per se. It's there's a reluctance to come back to work. And I think yeah. what has happened is people have realized, is that what I want to do? Is that what I want? Do I want to sit behind a desk? Do I want to work for somebody? And not saying everyone's going to go start their own business, but they're asking themselves these important life altering questions saying, because they've had time to reflect and they're saying like, what is important to me? And you know, this has worked. I've been able to work from home. I've been able to do hybrid. And now these companies are saying, okay, you know, we're going to ch- go back to the way it was. And it's like, why? And do I want to? And do you value my opinion? So I think that's one side of the coin where it's not, a, you know, Australia is facing a, an actual physical, there's not the people there before. Whereas here, there is the people, but there's the reluctance. And so they're like, well, and companies are totally oblivious to why people don't want to come back. And I think that's a big problem. And I think small businesses can take a lesson from that. Well, and then to add on to that, uh, there is these, um, I don't know, the memes that go around this meme culture where we communicate in, you know, little tiny one liners and images and people are like, uh, the government is paying us enough to stay home. Why would we want to go back and work for minimum wage? We make less there than we made at work. And although I, I'm going to have to disagree with it to, to a degree, the problem is, is that uh, this is a Tony Robbins thing. When the pain of change is less than the pain of staying the same, people will change. And this is one of those situations where as a, I don't know, a, an unintended consequence, the government paying us money to stay home because that's the only way we're going to survive made it easier for us to go, is it really worth going back to this place where the management is abusive, the culture is toxic, people are, are trying to run some kind of status-based hierarchy and it's and it's not fulfilling. I have no purpose, but at least with you know a couple hundred bucks every week, I'm safe. At least for a couple hundred bucks a week, I'm not being destroyed as a human being and working these ridiculous hours. So I think it all points back at the thing that Kobe you're, you're outlining here. And that's that, that workplace culture and how um, attractive that is for people to work there. I know that there are some places that they're not experiencing a shortage of work at all. In fact, it's completely the opposite. So what's happening in those places and how can you implement that same thing over here in your business, whatever that business is, if you had a small business um, and you had a manager and that manager just so happened to be a dick, but you didn't know that because to your face, he's, you know, nice, calm, cordial, cool guy. But then when you leave, he's just an a-hole to everybody that's on the team. Those, those people aren't going to want to come back to that. And so it speaks to uh, that upper level management and their, you know, their roles that they're meant to play. And it's not to be some tyrant that rules over everybody and dictates what you should and shouldn't do. It's creating and fostering that goal-oriented focus of taking people uh, and giving them a purpose. Like when you're stocking the shelves on Walmart, you're not just putting boxes on a shelf. 
what you're doing is you're, you're making it possible for mothers to feed their children lunches. And that's a huge thing because you are a part, an integral part of creating the future, our youth, you know what I mean? And so if you reframe that, those purposes now from that top down perspective, I personally think that that would offer a lot more improvement in that workplace culture, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Look at, you know, you know I'm just thinking about a couple of things. Look, I think it's, it's important for us to, you know, in terms of, so we can, you know, people listening that we can give something to take away from this. I fully empathize with the entrepreneur who is losing their shit because the people around them that they're employing are constantly making mistakes. I fucking get it. It's however, you know, what what um, you know, book, you know, quick book tip for everybody, get a copy of The Advice Trap by Michael Bungay Stanier. It's one of the best books right now. And and what it basically says is, you know, the first piece of mindset for the the you know the the business owner or operator in creating an attractive workplace is first thing come to the realization that you are not the smartest person in the room because when you're running your business you you you, even though you might think you are you've got to talk yourself out of that and you've got to get that out of your head that you're not the smartest person in the room because if you were the smartest person in the room and you had the most ability of everybody you could do it all without anybody but the reality is you are paying employees and you're paying people to come on board. And so the, the actual reality is, well, you, 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 although in your head you're telling yourself that you're the smartest person in the room who can do everything, you can't because you're actually paying people money each week to come and help you. So then you've got to, t- you've got to take this mindset that you're not the smartest person in the, ro- in the room. And actually, they're all at least as smart as you because you can all figure out the problem and figure out the solution and you've got the answer. And the only thing that you may have is more experience. You've had more practice. You've been at it for longer. So if you actually, you know, for a lot of the people that work for me, if I, if they have had had been at it for as long as me, they're better at it. And in fact, the humbling scenario that I have here is I have our COO that works for us in this best practice business. He was the CEO for 22 years doing my job before I got started. And so the simple fact that I watch him, he's better at it than me. Yeah, we're different in different ways. And I, you know, I'm a little bit softer and have better soft skills than he's got, but he's incredible with budget and finance and dealing with people. And, 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 you know, he's just got 22 years more experience than I do. And he's a little bit old school, but that's okay. So, so I think the first, that first piece of mindset is really important because then what happens is when you start to look at the people around you and look at the people that are showing up to your organization every day to kind of Mitch's point and, and your point, Bevan, is, to, is that they, they're showing up for a reason. They're prepared to make mistakes. They're prepared to give it a go. And if you look at them and you say, actually, if I can keep my mouth shut for, for two more minutes than usual, this incredible growth happens because you, you, the people around you are starting to go, actually, I'm getting a chance to speak up. I'm getting a chance to put my, forward my suggestions. I've, I lost sleep last night thinking about this little problem in my part of the business that I'm trying to solve. And I come in and when I get shut down and I get told no or whatever that might be, I go, oh, well, fuck it. I'll just wait and I'll just do what he wants because then I won't be liable and it won't be my problem. And but, but, you know, if you look at hygiene factors and motivation factors as two critical things in the workplace, you can go Google that. Hi, Google hygiene factors, motivating factors. If you give people challenging work and you let them do it and you create the safe place that, oh, look, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to carefully and cautiously monitor them like a parent would, like you're sitting at a barbecue and the kids are in the pool and you're drinking a beer and, and, and you're like, all right, I'm just going to watch the kids out of the corner of my eye and I'll jump in and grab them if they're going to drown. Um, and so, so if you, if you have that kind of, that viewpoint, then they will get experience and they'll get better and better. And then a year goes by and, oh my God, they're, they're stepping up and they're taking over and they, and, and they become incredible in terms of resources for you. And that for me, I, I only start with that and say that because that's what I've noticed over the last three years. I kind of, I kind of already knew, but then I had this really conscious moment where, hang on a minute. I'm not the smartest person in the room. And I kept telling myself that I had to kind of keep saying that because I got this enormous ego. And so I'm like, right, pull that back. Now what I'm realizing is I literally have a goal now of just to sit in silence. 
<laughs> and that's a really, really valuable thing to do in that silence. You, you learn a ton of shit. Uh, I'm a firm believer of the uh, idea that people value the things that they invest in or they work for. And if you don't give somebody an opportunity to invest in something, you don't give somebody an opportunity to work for something, then they're done. They're cashed out. I'll, I'll use this as an example. Um, this company that I'm working with right now, they, uh, they have a really chaotic sales process. I would argue that they have no sales process. And that's a big problem for them because they're spending tens of thousands of dollars every month on generating inbound leads. But there's no sorting of those inbound leads. And then the sales guys are now responsible for managing this improperly sorted group of leads. And then there's a group of people on the team that are, um, their role is to do data stuff. They got to analyze how well is the marketing working? How well is the sales guys working? Where can we improve or double down on? And it's just complete chaos. And um, I made a mistake. I got called on the mistake and I completely appreciate that I get called on my mistake. And uh, when we did a deep dive into why this mistake existed, well, I didn't get a, a piece of the process. And that's uh, a problem with their onboarding, but it's also a problem because that exists globally for everybody that's on the team. So I'm one foot out the door at this point. I'm not happy with the way things are going. I go straight to the uh, top of the chain here and I message the guy. And no, sh no longer after I message that guy, do I get <clears throat> a calendar invite for a meeting with this new person that's been put on the team for the next day? So I go into that meeting. I have that meeting with these people and they're like, Hey, we know there's a problem. It sounds like you might know or be able to offer some insight into how we can correct this problem. Cause that's what we want to do. So could you please share some of your ideas? And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> this is exactly the moment I've been waiting for. So I unload this is the whole thing from my perspective where you guys need to fix and adjust your process so that I can do my job. These guys can do their job. Everybody's going to be happy and we can continue pushing towards the goal uh, that, that we all have in mind. And, uh, and then the next day I ended up on the call with the lead guy and he was like, uh, the moment you sent me a message, I knew something was wrong and I took action to correct it. And hopefully you appreciate that we did that. And it was just one of those moments that um, even though I'm kind of a contractor, not an employee, uh, I was like, I felt valued. I felt oh, heard. I, I felt like there was something that I contributed to that. And I think there's a lesson here for everybody tangibly who's running a business or trying to manage a, a team or a group of people. And that is if you don't give people on your team a chance to invest in what you're creating, they're not going to care about it. And you might be at a 10 out of 10 on your dream coming true. And you hire somebody, you're lucky if they come up past a five because they got their own set of dreams. So you'd have to indoctrinate them to get them up to a six, seven or an eight, but they're never going to be at a 10 where you are. And you got to accept that and, uh, and adjust your process now to compensate for that. At least that's my perspective. But um, what do you think of all of that? Like, what would you have done differently in that situation? Yeah, look, I think um, I think the approach that I've been recently taking is, you know, this, and I, I can't speak highly enough of that. You know, there's the first book in the series, The Coaching Habit, by Michael Bungay standing here, and then it's the second, um, the second book in the series, um, which is The Advice Trap. Um, Michael Bungay standing here is the author. I think he's living, he's he's an Australian living in Canada. Um, so so essentially. Um, be a little bit more curious around the problem statement. And, and this kind of applies to, you know, as, as a business owner or as a business leader. So I, I really want to make sure that anyone listening is kind of saying, okay, what can I do? Is, is we jump too quickly to a solution. And, and, it's a, and fundamentally, it's a male trait that we want to pro solve problems, right? So it's a, it's a male thing. So it's, it's males do it more than females. We jump too quickly. We're not curious enough. So it's be a little bit more curious. And so if you need a, a hack, who, what, when, where, how, why, if you can answer at least those questions, then, then you can get clearer on the problem statement because when you're super clear and it sounds like what happened in that scenario is that you went, hang on a minute, let's spend a bit more time on the problem. And, and part of that problem was that the senior guy is not necessarily involved as closely as he should be 
not not in problem solving or investigation, but in terms of actually saying, hey, this is a problem, we need to solve this. You guys need to work better together, you know, in the different parts of the team. So, so I think the, the tip is how can we be a little bit more curious, not to the point where you get spreadsheet analysis paralysis, but to you, but you get to this point where you say, actually, have we spent enough time analyzing this problem? Tomorrow I've got all my managers here in the office, we're doing our quarterly planning day. Um, we're reviewing, did we hit our goals from the last quarter? We're going into the goals for the next quarter. There's some, you know, bigger challenges that the business has got um, over the next, you know, rolling 12 months. So we're looking at, we always look four quarters ahead, but we lock down the next quarter in terms of what our goals are. Some of our challenges, you know, we're looking at acquisitions. So we're looking at three acquisitions in the next 12 months. Um, the top, you know, what kinds of businesses are we looking to buy? Why are we looking to buy them? What's our bigger goal? Um, you know, the, the, and, and looking at doing the due diligence, we haven't finished setting up our due diligence framework. Um, and, and that's kind of been because it's not, a, it's not an important, urgent thing because it's not, it's not on fire, you know. So tomorrow I'm going to set fire to that problem to create the sense of urgency. So it's, it's, you know, it's an important thing for our growth strategy for the business and, and humans are coming in and reacting every day, but these quarterlies give them an opportunity to, to sit down and be curious about the problem. And so, I, so I've told them all, you're not going to hear from me tomorrow. I'm going to sit in the corner and you're going to spend the whole day wondering what I'm thinking. <laughs> You know, you know, once if if I if I speak first, and so you know, if if you're having here's another tip. If you're if you're in a meeting, you know, it's a pre-start meeting for a restaurant, it's a it's a it's a start of the shift session for a contractor, like a pre-start or a toolbox meeting for a contractor, it's a it's an office meeting for the business. The leader must always speak last. So as the, if you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you're a supervisor, if you're a business owner and you're listening to this and your team come together for a meeting, by all means say this is the agenda, but don't, you know, you've got to speak last. So you don't throw your solution or your problem. You can ask some questions, but you can't provide statements. And, and when we move, as the frustrated entrepreneur, it's rant, 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 problem, problem, problem. And the team will either shut down or they'll step up and, and so you want to hear what people have got to say because ultimately, ultimately, you want to turn that business into an investment. And if you want business freedom, then your goal every day should be to empower your people to grow so you can have the freedom. While you sit there and speak first and rant and carry on like a crazy person, you, you, you're actually locking yourself into a lack of business freedom. This sounds like, um, like an, I think it's like an old... Chinese proverb or something that loosely translates to uh, stop trying to be right and instead start start searching for right. And so if you're in the pursuit of That's looking it. for what's the right solution here, rather than I'm right, you must do what I say, et cetera, et cetera. So that, like you said, it keeps you bo boxed in. But if you're just on a pursuit of trying to figure it out, that's much easier for everybody. It's very palatable for the entire team to navigate and manage that um, I guess environment culturally. I think that 100%. That, I think that brings in the difference between an owner manager and a leader. And when you have the mindset of a leader, you will be a better business owner, entrepreneur, manager. Uh, I think a lot of people look at the title of owner or manager and they use it um they think that they have to kind of, you know, push that opinion or push that experience into people's face to justify what they're doing. But it's like, it's your business. Nobody's questioning that it's your business. You're just running it poorly. I think that's a difference. Something I wanted to touch on too, kind of circling back to the coming out of the pandemic, a few things that have been noticed, let's just say in the corporate world, um, not, not so much smaller entrepreneurs, but um, is operating expenses through the pandemic. Uh, that's That's been a really... Uh, challenging topic. And some of the approaches uh, I think have been very toxic. Um, one of them, for example, well, if you're working from home, you don't need to make as much money. So we're going to pay your, we're going to cut your pay. Um, that's been a one that's been shouted at the rooftops. Another one is, is expenses. Well, if you're not working from the office, you're working from home, you know, you're not traveling to the office, so you don't need, you know, gas money, for example, my, my argument to this and 
you know, you guys can weigh in on this. If your employees have been working through this for you from home, whatever hybrid, however, you know, you've made it work, they're using their own expenses. They're using their own internet. They're, you know, they're still, they're basically running an office out of their home that they're not getting covered for. And a lot of companies even gave up their offices and ran everyone mobile. And then they want to cut more costs. And it's like, well, you already cut floor space costs, rental costs. Like don't, you're, you're misinterpreting your PNL and you're doing it terribly at the expense, not just of the financial result of your uh, employees, but now you're attacking their mental well-being. And, and I know that you uh, released a poll that specifically addressed is an employer responsible for the mental health of its employees. And to me, devaluing the work that they bring to the table, whether in the office or whether at their home, it attacks the mental well-being and it's going to attack the productivity. And you're, you're kind of cutting yourself off at the, at the base here. And I think that that's like, I don't know, how do, how do, you, how do you express that to a business owner who's so over with finances and money because the pandemic and, oh, we don't have the sales that we had and blah, 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 blah. And they're taking it out on their employees who are in the trenches for them every day. Yeah, it's a look. It, it is a challenge, um, and so so let's you know I'm going to be 100 percent vulnerable and transparent with this, and, and and talk about our situation. So when when the pandemic started for us, um, you know we we had a really really great uh, window of opportunity where we cut floor space. So. Um, we were negotiating with our landlord. Uh, we were on month to month. We'd, f- we'd finished the first four years of the lease um, and we were on month to month. So we had an opportunity where we went, actually, we don't need to cut salaries and wages right now. Um, so the first thing we can do is cut floor space. So we did that. So we went, you know, essentially uh, office-based, um, you know, uh, uh, home-based essentially immediately and, We've got the, one of our businesses, not all the businesses, but one of the businesses we're able to do that with. And so uh, that cut $15,000 a month, which was really exciting because it meant that it took the pressure off, okay, what do we do with people? Um, the second thing that we had to do um, to, to basically, we had to make a decision. Do we make one or two people redundant and, and, and offload them or do we all take, um, or do we all take an, a, a cut? So we did. We cut what we have as essentially a car allowance. So we had people getting paid annually $16,500. Not everybody in the business, but a small chunk of the traveling people that, that are our, our traveling technical people. We, we had to cut that car allowance because we said, well, everybody's at home um, and, and your, your, your comment there about gas money. Um, what we did do, though, is we said, look, if you have to travel, then, then we will pay a kilometre rate. So we changed it and we will hand that to our customer. So we said to our customers, we're going to try to work remotely. We're going to try and save you money. We're going to try and save us money. So, so we're not, it's not that we're taking it away. It's that we just went, there's a $16,000 car allowance and it's for traveling to sites to see clients. That's what it's for. It's very clearly separate in, in the pay packet. We're going to take that fixed cost away from our business and we're going to make it variable. So for some people that in different parts of the country, they went out, to, you know, they weren't in lockdown, they were able to travel. They're then, you know, a little bit more administration, but net amount, if they traveled the same amount, they actually were about 20 to 30% better off. So for some people, they just weren't getting that money into their bank and they weren't necessary, they weren't driving their vehicles and, and, and gas and that kind of stuff. So it was a challenge. And I won't say it was easy. And, and at the time we went, okay, well, this is the best way forward. So while we took the fixed cost away, we put a variable cost back. Um, the second thing that we did do was I went, and I've always been an advocate for this, we cranked up the, the cellular mobile data plan on our company and, and we buy the fastest biggest network. So here in Australia, it's, I think AT&T is your big one, you know, where we're Telstra. And so we just went, let, let's go right. So we, we did a flip from where we were on Vodafone, quite a, quite a cheap uh, organization in terms of cell cover, low, poor quality cell coverage, crap data. So we cranked the mobile data and we said to everybody, do not be concerned about hotspotting off your, everyone has iPhones. So we give everyone iPhones, we give everyone good technology, um, and, so, and so we did that. So then what I was like halfway through, I was like, hang on a minute. We still got people, they're not using their hotspots. Let's give everybody $50 a month to, to contribute to their internet cost. 
And I, and that is, you know, I went and looked at all the plans for broadband for people's houses and I went, actually, that's a very good plan, $50 a month. So for a lot of people, they were on 10 bucks a month or $20 a month. And we went, all right, let's give them $50 a month. Um, you know, that's going to more than contribute to, to that. Um, and then, of course, if they need stationary office supplies, any of that sort of stuff, we'll always reimburse that. So we went through that process. Um, where, where we were at, where we're at, and, and our board and the, the leaders, we were like, we've got to keep this thing functioning. We did have a big drop in sales. We had a, you know, our bottom line went to zero um, and, and we're coming back out of that. But it meant that we were able to keep people on board um, to a certain extent. And then there was some people resigned and, and there was a couple of redundancies through the process where we were making changes to the business. Um, but by and large, we've then been investing in how do we actually get our costs down? So as a business owner, you've really got two things. You, if you can't control your price, you've got to control your costs. And if you can't control your price, you've got, you know, in your quarterly sessions and your thinking innovation, if you can't control your price, your price is set by the market, potentially, you've got to control cost. You've got to get yourself out of a price-driven marketplace through innovation. So you've got to be researching and investing in an alternative product that gives the same benefit to your customer at a lower price. Or you've got to think about moving into another niche or a different niche where the margin is a little bit higher. And that is the small steps of innovation that a business owner needs to be thinking of. You know, the, uh, I just want to give lots of really good examples. Uh, a restaurant. A restaurant. Te the, the objective of specials is don't have the same special every day you know, and it's painted on the menu board, the idea of specials is your wholesalers will have things that are in season. And when they're in season, there there's lots of supply. And so you can get your raw materials cheaper. And so, so the idea of specials is you're testing, you're constantly testing potential new things, not what the chef thinks the market wants, but, but test it with the customers. And if a special becomes really popular, you, you add it to the main menu. Don't lock yourself into a seasons menu like the the fall menu or the winter menu or the or the spring menu test specials because when things are in supply you can get them a little bit cheaper you know fruit vegetables meat fish um th they will come on you know here in this country we have a lamb season and lamb comes when lamb's on it's cheap the rest of the year it's really expensive and when it's cheap it's also the best quality so get lamb on your menu as a special and your margins higher and then you can and you use that as a as a as a profit center. So you're not controlling, you're not controlled by price. If you're going to sell a margarita pizza or a meat lover's pizza and everybody else is selling margarita meat lover's pizza, your customers are going to shop on price. So right. you've got to, you know, you've, you've got to be thinking, you know, you, you know, think as you come out of this pandemic, what opportunities are there for things that are in high supply and can you be creative with it, creative with it? Because when it's in high supply, the price comes down. But okay, so I just want to acknowledge something here, and I think that this would be easy for people to kind of gloss over here. The way that you handled the challenge of the pandemic and you know the different problems that it created for your business, uh, you took a really, really creative approach to the whole thing, and I and I think that's something to be admired. Um, but not so much as an ego stroke here, more as a lesson for everybody else that. Um, is kind of in that exact same boat here trying to, you know, figure this out. You were able to cut some of your costs, uh, but then maintain that your team is valuable to you by uh, supplementing some of their incomes in other areas to make sure that it's like, oh, I do matter. Okay. this is And so that's, that's really awesome. I think um, that is a skill. I think that that's a, a, a something that you can practice or something that you can be taught, something that you can learn. Um, what tips or tricks do you have for somebody who who do, who lacks that skill and needs to develop that skill and knows that? Like, what can somebody right now? Like, I'm stuck in a box. I don't know what to do, but I know I know I need to be creative. What could what could you offer to help somebody in that in that position? Yeah, look, I, I, I literally was thinking about this last week and a realisation. So I, when I started my business and I was small, I've been going, for anyone who doesn't know, I've been going 17 years. Um, and prior to that, I was running, you know, my dad's business. And prior to that, my the girlfriend at the time was running her dad's business, um, various other businesses. So I, I didn't value doing things for people. I didn't value kind of giving people. I was like, I pay you money. Why would I give you a gift? 
you know, the perks, if you like. So here's, the, here's my trick. Why does Facebook give everybody food every day? Why does Facebook feed all their people? They put big kitchens in their offices and you can just go up and to, the, to the cafeteria. It, it's free. Why do they do that? Next question. Why does Google have toys in their office? Why do they have, you know, air hockey tables and pool tables and table tennis tables and, and areas where you can go to sleep and areas where you can watch movies and areas where you can sit in beanbags? Why do tech companies have, you know, again, table ten tennis companies, why do tech companies wear, let people wear hoodies? Why do companies let people have casual Friday? Why do companies send out hampers to their people? Why do, why do they have branded merchandise? So it's, it's so, and, and then, so why do they do that? And then what benefit? They clearly are spending the money. They're clearly spending the money. So be curious about, well, they continue to spend the money so it must do something positive or they wouldn't do it. There's, it's an ROI positive activity. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it wasn't kind of a thing of the 90s. It's a thing of now and it continues. Why are people like me saying, if you want to work from home, continue to work from home? I, I don't want to be here in the office. I'm in the office today and I'm here tomorrow, but I've made it very clear to my team that I am going to continue to work from home. That's what I'm doing. If you want to work in the office, work in the office, but don't expect me to be here because I don't want to be here. And I'm going to be happier if I don't have this kind of get up, get dressed, go through the routine, drive in the traffic, turn up in the office. That's not me. If you want a happy boss, let me work from home. If you want an unhappy boss, expect me to be in the office. So, and, and so that, that's my mindset. Now, I get it's not for everybody. My brother is polar opposite. You know, he, he's nine years younger than me. You know, we, we're right beside each other. And, and he's like, no, I need them there. I need them in front of me. I need them to, to know what they're doing. And so for me, I see this 10 year, I, you know, ten, I see myself 10 years ago where I didn't value giving people things. I didn't value letting people kind of do their thing and experiment. I didn't value letting people just drift and do whatever they want. When you come to work for me, I let you do whatever you want. And if what you want to do is not something I want to pay for, then I go find a company for you to work at so you can do what you want. So, so when I need things done, then I go looking for people who want to do those things. Rather than saying to somebody, you work for me, you'll do whatever the fuck I tell you to do. Like, no, I, I let the rookies, it's the, same as, it's the same as ice hockey, football, baseball, netball, swimming, pick a sport, they tell the rookies, they do the new season's draft, they put the rookies on the field and they say, go and do whatever you want to do because then, because they want people to deploy their talent and do what they want to do. So I think the creative thing that you, you kind of pointed out that, that, um, that I did do was we've done some other things. You know, we sent hampers out, we sent vouchers out, you know, go to the liquor store and get yourself a drink for the people that drink. Lots of people don't. Um, go to the liquor store, get yourself some drinks. We're going to have team drinks. Um, you know, we sent hampers out. We just had the global Are You OK Day. So we sent everybody some cho hot chocolate bombs and cookies in a little hamper to their house. Um, I don't value that stuff. I personally don't value that stuff. But I've seen when you do it, the positives that it brings, not for everybody, because some people still bitch, ah, oh, you shouldn't fucking send these hampers. You should just pay me more money. I'm like, that's sounding to me like you shouldn't be on our team. <laughs> sounding to me like you don't fit like in our culture. Ah, that's You're not bullshit. practicing gratitude. That's not good. <laughs> that's right. But, but then, so, so when someone comes at me with a shit test, it's like, you shouldn't have spent that $150 on that thing. You should have just paid me the $150. bucks. i am like, okay, so it's sounding like you're not going to be in this company much longer because you don't fit with our culture. Are you unco uncomfortable? Like that's what it sounded like to me because that was actually a nice gesture on our part and it was the thought that counts and we did it because we thought it would be nice. You didn't like it. Actually, I don't think you're going to fit with this team for much longer. Let's have a conversation about that. What about our work aren't you enjoying? Well, so, that I, drives it right back to the team. Sorry, Mitch, go ahead. No, no. It, I think the decisions that you made, I mean, you have a responsibility to keep your business flowing. That's Absolutely. not only for yourself, but for other people as well. They rely on you. And so I think a lot of companies had a backward approach to you. Their first thing was, how do we continue making the same level of profit that we are accustomed to? And people are dispensable for that. 
up here, Air Canada, the biggest, you know, flight um, or, or uh, you know, travel, yeah. air travel, 15,000 15, jobs just out, gone. Why? They've been, they've been proving, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of profit every year since I can remember ever hearing about it. And then they have six months of a rough turbulence and all of a sudden over a thousand jobs are gone just like that. Why? Because they have been accustomed to that and they're public companies. So they have to, you know, keep producing that bank. Same thing. Cutting jobs is the first thing they do. Whereas you came in and said, look, how can we, how can we keep everybody, but yet still maintain a business? Now, granted, there may be a few positions that do have to go, but that's going to be last resort. Let's start going through the numbers. And I think that although, yes, you have a responsibility to yourself and your family and your business, you led with that empathy. Your decision was based on the quality of you know, business and, and environment for the people. And I think a lot of businesses don't value leading with that. How do we maintain that environment? How do we attain that sustainability? And is that profitable? Not how do we maintain profit? Are people a liability? So mm. I, I do give you props for that because I think that that's a key thing that a lot of people miss, especially when they have, you know, 10 plus employees. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, I think that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, here on the perspective podcast, <laughs> we, we tend to talk a lot actually about Gary V and his little Gary V isms. And one of the things that actually stood out for me in my early days, because thank God I found him or else I wouldn't have this perspective, but my employees or the people that I employ or the people that I contract, they don't work for me. I work for them. And when I adopted that perspective, it was like, what can I do to make sure that you can do what you need to do to be fulfilled as a human being first and foremost, before anything else. But then beyond that, how do I empower you to do the job to the best of your ability? Because I know for in my situation, if I was to sit behind a computer and do some graphic design for a company or build a logo or something like man, that's my heart and soul I'm pouring out. Like I am re- like, I take my creativity very seriously, whether it's, you know, creatively artistic or music or whatever. I'm like, I'm hundred percent in your business is now my business. And I'm going to make sure that everybody knows how amazing your business is. Um, but, but I come from that perspective of like, I care about the people that I'm putting in that position before anything else, because without them, I have no business because I can't possibly do all 10 things and be profitable. And that's something that I noticed very, very early on. So for anybody that is in that position, um, you know, that has employees or has contractors or people working for you, shifting that paradigm just a little bit and, and deploying, like, like Kobe, you were saying there, that empathy, you know, uh, I know how you feel because it sucks to not have a job and not have a purpose and not be making an income and not be able to support your family and um, all of those problems. Now, how can I help you? How can I serve you to achieve that? I think that's a, a wonderful thing that you've done for all of your uh, staff. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but, you know, I spent a, I spent a bunch of time with Gary Vee in 2019 and, and right at the beginning of 2020. In fact, flying home, I spent a, a week in New York with him right at the beginning of, um, of, of 2020 and like flew home through Hong Kong through COVID, you know, to get, to, to get home and then, and then the pandemic started. But there's, there's a couple of really good sayings which I live and die by, which he's kind of put into words what I was already thinking. The first thing is, you know, I speak acts of service. I always have. I've always been right. Have you got everything you need? Have you got enough to go on with? Do you know what you're doing? Do you need any help? Those have been my go-to questions for forever, you know, in my career. And, and his, his statement was super high touch, super one-on-one. You know, we, we, I did this program, um, the Gary V experience, and, and it was organised and we went, you know, we did time in Sydney, time in London, time in New York, um, and met a bunch of great people and just spent a huge amount of time talking about organisational growth and development. It's surprisingly simple, super high touch, super one-on-one. And, and you're right, all those other things we just talked about, you, you, it's, it's about servant leadership. You're there to make sure that your team are, you know, in the right mindset, got the right tools, got everything that they need to do. And, that, and that's part of, you know, all organised people to organise people, if that makes sense. So, so I think that's one, super high touch, super one-on-one. Now, the other one, which I really love, is hiring is guessing, firing is knowing. Hiring mm. is guessing, firing is knowing. And so... When, you know, and, and the other kind of more detailed thing that he said, you know, on this topic we've been talking about today, everyone thinks he's all about marketing and social media. He's actually about organizational growth and development um, is 
if somebody is fucking up and they're not doing what you want them to do, what did you do wrong? Because it's your fault and, and, and owning it because you didn't set them up properly. You didn't onboard them properly. What was their induction program? As a manager, what training have you given them? What support have you given them? How long was their training program? What was your handover to them? And, and for most entrepreneurs who are, and business owners and leaders who are listening to this, I hope you're feeling guilty right now. Radical self-awareness. And you dropped them in the deep end and you expected them to perform and you didn't actually invest any time in them, in training them and getting them get working the way you want them to work. Now, there's lots of clever ways to get people to do that in adult education and adult learning. Um, and, and I will touch on that in a second. But but he was it's it's been really interesting. Um, so, so you do have the responsibility where you do have the responsibility. You've got to making, you've got to be making smart decisions about profitable direction and niche and leading your team into the niche is really important. That's your role and your responsibility. Then let your team do the work, you know, and, and was it you know, Gary, was it Gary that said, if, if somebody on your team fails in the first six months of their employment, it's your fault. Yes. I, I feel like I just read that from something he put out there. And I thought that was yeah. really powerful. Like if they can't do their job or they drop off or they quit in six months, it's not because they're, sure. an idiot. It, it's no. on you for one, That's you right. hired them. So if they were incompetent, that was That's still right. you, you, you made a bad yeah. choice. <laughs> right? And if they were really good and they still failed, it's on you, yeah. not their failure. Yeah. So I thought that was powerful and right in line with what you said. That's exactly right. And he's been saying that for a long time. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, and that, that is definitely something that, um, you know, we, the super high touch, super one-on-one. -on -one. I spent all day yesterday doing one-on-ones with my managers, 25 minute hits, 25 minutes, five minute break. You know, I did eight yesterday um, as a marathon. Um, so, so, and, and, and the, the benefits I'm now seeing from, so, and that's one of the things from the pandemic's perspective that we went straight to, we went straight into one-on-ones with, with everybody in the business remotely like this because we all were out of the office all of a sudden and we created the water cooler conversation. Um, and, and, and that was just basically go through the schedule, schedule 25 minutes to catch up face-to-face, -face, you know, cameras on, sit and just have a conversation. And then I've just got three really simple questions. What's on your mind and what else and what else? <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, and I, I love that because the, their first answer is never the right one, right? It's the one they think that you want to hear. Uh, who, I think it was you in that conversation. The first answer they give is not the one that they actually want. The second one is another one. And it's finally when you get into that third why that you have that you have that discovery with them and and all of a sudden it makes sense. And you know what? Touching base with the people that are a part of your team that is to serve whatever higher purpose you're serving um, makes a really, really big difference because it gives each and every one of them a chance to, uh, and I'm pointing back at the thing we mentioned before, invest in that growth. I love the analogy of the swimming pool and, you know, the dad watching, you know, carefully off in the distance because the people that you bring into that team, they need to learn how to swim and they Absolutely. can't do that if they're always wearing floaties. That's You're right. just going to yeah. learn how to float. And that's not good either. That's not good for either party because when the real danger hits like a pandemic, your business is gone or you're, you know, the, the floaties don't work anymore. They deflate and now you got a, well, a drown victim, but yeah, not even floaties. Like you can't, you can't teach someone to swim by swimming laps yourself in the pool and saying, stand there and watch, watch this, watch this, watch this. I'm better at it. Look, I'm faster. I'm faster. I'm better. I'm smarter. I can swim. I can swim. I can swim. Nobody learns. Chuck them in the pool, walk away. Let them swim, you know, yeah. hey, you know, reach a bit further, take a deeper breath. You know, if, if you, if you, if people can't swim, like literally, if you can't swim, swimming's a massive thing here in Australia. Everybody learns to swim. If you're drowning, take a deeper breath because it makes you float. It's pretty simple, you know, practical tip on swimming, but, but, you know, so, so, you know, that, that is, you know, one, that is one of the things that even to my managers, I'm like, if you've got enough, you know, they'll say, Oh, what's on my mind? I've got an uncomfortable conversation coming up. Take three deep breaths, write some notes about what's on your mind, and then sit in the conversation. Let the other person speak first. So that, that, that tip I said about the leader, the business owner, the leader speaking last, that, that applies to supervisors. So I hope anyone listening to the podcast, because you know, we are we're gonna we're gonna finish up shortly, but you know, 
whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in a restaurant or whether you're a contractor or whether you're, you know, any kind of business, it's important to have a 20 to 25 minute one-on-one conversation with everybody every week. What's on your mind and what else and what else? And it's that farming that you do with your team members that will have your business grow. We talk about business growth. I want my revenue to grow. I want my profit to grow. Well, you've got to grow your team. You've got to grow your capacity. And that growth comes from investing that 20 minutes to 25 minutes per week. And all you need to do as a business leader, it's really simple. Don't give any advice. You don't need to say anything. You just need to sit. You can literally shut your eyes and switch off and let them talk. What's on your mind and what else and what else? That is all I did yesterday. I did it eight times yesterday with eight managers, 25 minutes a a throw. Some of them went a little bit over and I did everything that I possibly could to not let any advice come out of my mouth because they know what they're doing. They just want to validate. They want to see your body. They're reading your body language. Mm. And, And over time, it does take practice. But they're like, right, I'm like, and one thing that Gary V, just to finish on him, he's really good at is when you ask him a question, he goes, you already know the answer. <laughs> like, fuck you. You already know <laughs> what I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you've it's seen just any validation. of my YouTube videos. Yeah. yeah. Um, quick, one of, the, one of the topics I want to hit just before um, we wrap it up regarding, we talked about changing our niche or potentially needing to change your niche. Um, post-pandemic, people's buying habits are different. People's values, their goals, everything, what they perceive is more important has changed through these, yeah. you know, last year, this last year and a half. And yeah. I, I, I find a lot of people, they say, well, that that's, I can't, there, there's no niche. Like I can't change. I have a staple or whatever. And they, they put all these obstacles, they put all these problems in front of their solution. And, you know, one of the examples that I, that I used is like, you can go to the gas station and buy a 24 pack of water for $5, or you can buy one bottle. That's one of those sizes for $6. Why, if they didn't sell, they wouldn't be on the shelf. So somebody found said, how do I make a niche instead of selling 24? I sell one for the same price and they, and they figured it out and it's marketing and it's, it's, it's all the same water. Like they just do one little thing different yep. and then they resell it. So for e- an individual business, if you're having a hard time changing your niche or saying like, how do I make a new niche? Like, is there something we can speak on to that quickly just yeah, to, yeah. to say like reevaluate yeah. what you're doing? Yeah. Look, we, you know, there, there's a, the, we can go really academic with this or we can go really simple. So let me give you the academic question because it's fast. And then I'll give you the simple, um, how to make it work that what works really easily. There's a book called beyond the hockey stick. And it's, and it's by McKinsey's. It's the big management consulting firm. And I was just looking for it. I've got it here somewhere. Um, it might have ended up at home. Um, and that's the academic version because it talks about, you know, you can look at geographical trends and industry trends and you can, you know, look at growth and you can look make sure that your P&L's got a line item and you're investing in innovation, that kind of stuff. That's the textbook answer. The pandemic, accelerate out of the pandemic answer is go and spend 100 hours talking to customers. So spend 100 hours talking to customers. So get your, get your smartphone out, turn on a timer and, and don't stop talking to customers. And, and I'm not saying driving and driving back is part of the 100 hours. I'm saying face-to-face, Zoom to Zoom, phone call to phone call, calling your all of your most recent transactions with your customers and saying what's on your mind and what else and what else. And what I found by spending um, some time last month, almost actually it was more than 100 hours last month, we just had the biggest month of sales ever. And, and it was because I was not, not because I'm better at sales because I'm not better at sales. There's, there's definitely better people in our organization better at closing. But by listening to the customers, I found that, yes, of course, they're going to keep buying the product or service that that they buy from us. And, and whether that's declining or increasing, that's kind of happening. It's kind of sales process that, we, that Bevan talked about, set and forget. What I found was actually they've got a few more problems. They've got a few more challenges and they are peripheral, tangible, on the sides of the service that we're providing. And an extension in this direction created a contraction. 
and, and then an extension and a contraction. And before you know it, we're in another niche. And then that opened up a marketplace for more customers. So it's kind of uh caterpillaring over to the other thing. I, I want to add yeah, to that. Actually, I think there's another really good book that um, people should uh, explore. It's called uh, Ask by Ryan Levesque or Ryan Levesque, depending on how French you are. <laughs> uh, very much the same thing, um, except he goes to the beginning. So if you're interested in starting a business or you want to create a business, first of all, examine the things that you enjoy doing or you're good at or whatever that is. And then start by asking people questions. And when you go out and you ask people questions, and this can be in many forms that I'll kind of elaborate on in a second, but when you go out and ask people questions, they're going to give you answers because they want those problems solved. And if they fit inside of that wheelhouse of things that you're good at or enjoy doing, then that creates an opportunity. And so the next thing from the next stage from asking them is like, okay, if I create a product that solves that problem, how much would that be worth to you? Right. And then from there, it's like, okay, I did that. I did those two things. I solved this problem with a product and it's priced around here. Are you interested in taking advantage of this? I can solve that problem for you now. And now you have a business from nothing, from scratch. If you're already right. in business, you can follow that exact same framework and go, hey, customers, we're having a, uh, you know, a hard time serving you the way that we traditionally serve you, a restaurant as an example. How do we serve you better? Well, one of the really great things is like, People still want to go out and have date nights. People still want to have experiences and enjoy good company and good food. And so what I've seen creatively, a lot of local restaurants have been doing is creating a date night package and then throwing that shit up on skip the dishes or Uber Eats or whatever it is. And, and now you're getting a date night experience that includes some extra stuff. Whatever that extra thing is like a box of chocolates or a rose gets included in the package or a candle for your, you know, your candlelight dinner. And what did it cost them an extra dollar, but they can price build that into the price. And now all of a sudden they're the most sought after, um, you know, thing on skip the dishes because they have this really, really cool thing that stands out. And so um, one of the tools that you can do is uh, run an ad campaign that is quite literally just a quiz funnel. And you just ask people, hey, um, these are the questions that I need to address. If you answer them, I'll buy you coffee. And you just send them a, you know, a $2 gift card to Starbucks or Tim Hortons as a you know, thank you to providing your business with a solution. But that's the creative um, execution on taking that idea of asking your people now and then, and then putting a solution to it. Yeah, I think the, just quickly that I, I know from experience that anyone doing that may get paralyzed by somebody's already done that. You know, I, right. I already see a business doing that. You know, there's already that market's already flooded. That is a perfect yes, because it means that there is revenues running, there's cash flows running in that space. I have been paralyzed for many times in my career until I realized this that I was always looking for an idea that somebody hadn't done. Instead of looking, just focusing on solving the problem for a customer, it's better to be best in a flooded market because you will attract revenue and you can then work on making it profitable. And that's what Toyota did. Toyota went to market and they said, we're going to put a car in this market because we know there's cars in this market. And they completely dis disrupted the American car industry. You know, American car industry exploded and then Toyota said, they're selling cars, so we're going to make one too. And then what we're going to do is just make it better and more reliable and people will buy it. And then we'll figure out how to make it profitable. So they, they couldn't control the price, they controlled the cost. And they got the costs right down. Why, how'd they do that? By stopping mistakes. So what I want anyone listening to just be mindful of, it's better to be go into a flooded market and attract some of that revenue and then figure out how to make it profitable. So don't get paralyzed and go, I haven't found this great idea and oh, somebody's already doing that and lose your momentum. Just go do it and, 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 and copy somebody else, you know, great artists. Um, so what is it? Um, good artists copy great artists steal. That's the whole <laughs> yeah. objective of this, right? So Shout out, Drake. <laughs> go steal someone's idea. And, yeah, exactly right. Go steal someone's idea. And, and, and then, you know, there's a really great book called um, Breakout Advertising by Edgar Schwartz. Um, it's, I think it's out of print. The last, I had to buy a copy of it. It was like $300. It was ridiculously expensive. But he was the guy that said, he talked about market sophistication. So if you can go into a flooded market and you can create a little bit more sophistication by building an alternative, that's what you said. An alternative to the date night is here's the package, here's the candle, here's the rose, here's a pack of cards or something. Um, it, you know, it, it, here is 40 questions to prompt the conversation. 
you know, that doesn't even so, cost you anything. You just print something oh, off on your printer and put yeah, it in the like, bag. Like it's brilliant. Literally that, you know, that, that, those 40 questions were my go-to thing 20 years ago. It was like, it was like clubbing seals in a barrel. You know, yeah. just, <laughs> this exact wants- thing happened to me in my business. When I started up, I got so narrow minded on this one thing that I wanted, this problem that I, I, and it still exists. It very much still exists. Most brands and companies are looking for straight for the kill ads. And this is like, I, we just want dollars and cents ROI. What's my LTV and CAC and all this other shit. And it's just like, okay, yeah, that's totally possible, but that expires very, very quickly. And this is why f- flyers change every week because people just don't care about that kind of stuff. What they really care about is the value you deliver. And so I had it, um, creating a model uh, very much like what Gary V does for his branding. It's called a sustainable content model. You create content that, you know, engages with the people you want to serve and you create relationships. And over a long period of time, it strengthens and deepens those relationships. And then they inevitably turn into customers. If I ever have a chance to pay the amount of money that I could pay to Gary V for him to help me with my business, trust me, I'm going to pay it. But that's not what customers wanted at the time. And so the shift that I had to make was, okay, what other options are there that still fit inside of the wheelhouse of things I enjoy and like to do? And it turned out that the bigger problem that most of these businesses were having was we just want a really simple type of engagement-based content that will get our users to like and comment, and then we'll handle the rest of it from there. And it was like, okay, there's a hole. Who else needs this? Put your hand up. And then all of a sudden, my pipeline is full, my business is flourishing again, and everything goes to the place... or takes me on to the path of now eventually I'll find one company that's that has the dollars and cents to make that sustainable content model work. And then we can work on a branding package. It'll be a higher ticket offer. And, and then I'll be happy that I get to do both of these two things. But it took me being flexible enough to go, you know what, maybe this isn't what I need to be talking to people about. Maybe I need to be talking to them about the thing that they're looking for. And uh, my partner put it best. If they want the red ball, sell them the red ball. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Just be there and and be present to, you know, the needs of the people that you're trying to serve. I think it's really, really important. So that was a very good point. Um, Any, any last words before we wrap things up here? Look, I think it's just, it's, it's about keeping it simple. And, and that, that, you know, those couple of tips, it's about, you know, I, I guess we kind of put the thread over this about communication, but, you know, I've watched a few businesses really go, you know, where, did, you know, what do we do? Where did it go? And when they go talk to a hundred, you know, customers for a hundred hours, even five hours, four hours, you, you're literally going to go 10 hours and you're going to have so many opportunities that you're, you're going to be like, what happened? The risk is that you stop doing that. And, and I think that that's what's happened is with the pandemic and public health restrictions is our regular communications, like our regular drop-in coffees or our sales round, you know, those, those cycles of communication have been disrupted. And so we've got to rebuild those cycles. And don't go back to, I need to get in the car and do a road trip or get on a plane and fly places. It, it's, it's easier now more than ever. You know, look at what we're doing. We're on the opposite sides of the planet. And, and, and we're building these really great conversations and, and helping people everywhere. So, so I think it's, it's embracing this technology that, you know, I know a lot of business owners don't want to. Um, it's, it's speaking last, it's being curious, and it's spending time building deep, friendly relationships with people. That is, is, is gonna, that's what's going to give you the, the benefits off into the future. Uh, I think a summary um, is people, we live in a, we live in a, an environment, a culture, and, and, and not just country-based, but because of our access to information, people have a um, immediate gratification desire. They need everything to happen now. If they have a goal, it has to happen now. And if it's, if that goal is, you know, beyond, you know, that little comfort zone, well, then it's not a goal they want and they move on. But I think what, what I'm kind of hearing and, and I agree with, and I've always kind of went with is organic takes time. But organic is the most sustainable that you will get. Uh, a flash up business that says, oh, I, I made an Amazon company in 30 days. I was making you know, six, seven figures. Well, that's great. But is it sustainable? And, and that's the question they never answer. Whereas you look at other companies, they're huge. You look at Elon Musk. Look at how many companies he's had, how he grew them. And would you say that Tesla is a sustainable company? I think so. It's not going away tomorrow and the flux in the market, it's not overly affecting him. 
Why? Because it was organic growth over time. And you put in, you know, that work. And I think you go, you can look at other examples throughout the markets and say, organic growth is sustainable. And I think everything that you've pointed to that we've talked about shows investing in your team, investing in your clients, investing in the market, investing in yourself. They don't happen overnight. It's not yeah. instant gratification, but it's an organic growth that creates sustainability. 100%. Beautiful. On that note, uh, if you're watching, listening, anywhere you are, wherever you're finding this, like, comment, subscribe, share it with a friend, tag a friend. Uh, if you think this is going to help somebody, that's uh, the mission that we're on here is to help as many people as we possibly can with this content. So uh, in that note, or on that note, um, if you do need help or support from us or any of the guests that are on the show, you can send us an email at email, the perspective at gmail.com. For now, that's a wrap and we will see you in the next episode. Bye for now.